The only thing we're writing with are visual forms. We write with color. We write with shape, right? Yeah. It's really all about the narrative. How you put it together, hey, that's up to you. I think it was about 2 a.m. Now, I'm a night person, but this night I was asleep, and the phone rings, and I'm very confused. I answer the phone, and um, the voice says, hey, it's Jesse from the art meeting. I'm like, okay, yeah, what's up, dude? And I remember, remember meeting Jesse, and um, I'm half asleep, but he's... He's asking me all these questions, you know, about, at the time I was a photographer, primarily. He's asking me all about the photo biz, you know, is it a good biz? And, you know, we get way into the conversation and I'm starting to wonder, why has this guy called me? <laughs> and finally, uh, he's like, hey, I got some paintings that I need photographed, can you do that? And uh, it's like, yeah, sure. He's like, all right, I'll hit you up. Click. It took me a little while to hear back from him, but then I, I went to go see him. I carried my equipment, three flights of stairs. And um, that started what I called one of my primary educations because I was a photographer at the time but for years after that, I would go to photograph Jesse's work. And he was one of the only painters that would just answer my questions. If I asked him how he did this, he just let loose on it. You know, any question that I had, and that I, I didn't realize that that's what I was becoming. So if you look at my work, you'll see... Jesse Cantu in it because uh, that's kind of my roots. And so I'm ecstatic to have him here on Artist Bebop. How are you, sir? You remember any of that? Great, yeah, it, it, it's, it's coming back really quick. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show, man. Yeah, man. No, I, uh, my sister, she had your painting behind her during her uh, our little chat and we I started to started to talk about Jesse and I was like I got to bring him on man so so how I appreciate it yeah we we haven't talked in a while what are you what are you doing man so you know as a painter you're always increasing your base you're still trying to sell and you have to kind of be resourceful especially in this kind of pandemic so you know you still network you still try to move about as best you can you try to get product out there whatever it is you know so it's just a hustle and a grind all the time well talk to me about what are you doing these days because when i when i knew you people pretty much would come to you is that is yeah this... it's the same thing uh except more these days, it's more through social media. And so even though I had kind of a certain drop off in terms of business due to COVID and everything, you know, I'm, I'm still hanging in there. So it's just a matter of reaching out to different kind of clients, you know, and trying to promote where you can, whether it's a restaurant, it's at the art store, you know, it's, out and about so you know the grind never stops you just have to stay on the hustle you know it's interesting to hear you talk about use of social media because back in the day i remember you were reluctant to even get a cell phone so what what changed <laughs> i mean you know so what you gotta eat you gotta pay your bills right that's what i always told you jesse to adapt, be able to adapt. So that's just evolution, right? 
No, and totally. You're talking about pandemic. That's immediately where I went because, um, I mean, I have to say when it was just me, that was a lot easier. I can survive on very little. My kids cannot. And so, you know, absolutely social media. I'm glad to see you embrace it. And Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. I, um, when I saw your post, I think the day before yesterday, maybe it was today where I, I said something like, I, you know, I, I'd be lying if I say, if I'm, if I say that, uh, the pandemic hasn't affected me. Yeah. So can you talk about like, what's it doing to your, your thematics? What's it doing to so, the actual work? Yeah. So, you know, this kind of virus, it's really tearing up a lot of people physically, mentally, psychologically, you know, it's really gone across the board. And so when you see something like that, and I'm kind of a internalist, everything comes within, you know, I don't create assignments for myself. A lot of people do. I don't, you know, people want to work that way. Hey, that's cool. But for me to get where I'm going, I have to see what's out and what's happening in nature. So, you know, everything's upside down now. And so, you know, how can you not feel that? That kind of energy seeps into my artwork. And so I think the one that I posted yesterday, you'll see some kind of person or kid deteriorating. Um, you know, you hear a lot about it affecting everyone. No one's immune. You know, this disease or virus, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, it's relentless, bro. And I think you have to kind of change your artwork if you want to bring some kind of attention to it. And for me, that's what it's been, you know. So uh, how is your situation? I, I have um, one of the twins has asthma, so I don't really leave the house much. What, what is your situation? Yeah, I really don't go outside, you know. I mean, very rarely, um, you know, get some stuff at the grocery store, go to the gas station. But really, I'm just hustling, man, as much as I can. You know, I'm not doing so many large works just because people are limited in space. And, you know, I think the last stats I heard are 30 million people, they're unemployed. So that kind of pool, you know, it's gone for me, you know, those were 30 million potential customers I could gravi gravitate to, you know, but that's dried up now. So you have to either work smaller or you have to sell more multiples, you know, so you just have to be resourceful. What's worked for you social media wise the most? Uh, hmm. I think Facebook's really helped me a lot, you know, um, just getting in contact with other people through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, that's really good. And um, I have a strong group of friends, uh, primarily from U of H and HBU. And so there's always a uh, back and forth, you know, trying to have your ear to the ground and see what's happening. Yeah. Have you played on Instagram at all? I'm getting that done now. Okay, good. What did you? Yeah. Did you get a? Do you have an Instagram name? It's Jesse Alexander Cantu. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm just looking um in terms of the kind of imagery I want there. Yeah. So you're being very conscious of. Oh yeah, for it, sure. Okay. I'm. Like this time, especially, I've looked at social media a lot, and uh, it's just interesting. Uh, I'm watching um, this guy, actually, Gary V, talking about the internet and using it to do your thing. And one thing that he talks about is on the internet, content is king. And he actually talked about Instagram specifically. 
Um, he's like, don't treat it like your art gallery. And I think as artists, we all think of it as our art gallery. And I was doing that, but I'm starting to listen to him and it's working for me because really social media, it's a, it's a machine that yes, we put our artwork out there. It is about the artwork, but it's also about selling that artwork. And part of what sells an artwork is the artist, whether we agree with that or not. People are often collecting the person. Right. Because I had a conversation with you because I like what he said, because I liked what he was wearing. Or she, you know. Um, I, I would like a piece of that and I would like that on my wall. You know, because, I don't know. What do you think about all that? No, I think you have to attack it from a more business professional sense. You know, you know, you, you're the your your products are the painting or the sculptures. You know, people want to know um, a little more of you because they want to have a piece of you. You know, and all the paintings and whether it's a sculpture, a collage, it's an extension of you. So that really makes sense if he's hitting it from the business side. Yeah. I'm just, I've been really interested to talk to you about this. One, because I miss our conversations. I miss having lunch with you and um, just hanging out. But, you know, you come from an academic background. You're not like a lot of the rest of us bums. Um, you have an MFA in this stuff. <laughs> but, um, but you know what? I'm glad you mentioned that. But because, you know, there's different domains and there's different kinds of art. And so there's room for everyone. You want to be an outsider artist, you can make money. You want to be a commercial artist, you can make money. You know, whether you're a studio artist or you're freaking doing surrealism or, you know, collage or assemblage, whatever it is, you know, you just have to find your niche. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like I said, watching you, kind of growing up with you, I had a secondary education. I did go through a photography program, but my ideas of composition, of narrative, it was really cool. And I'm, I'm thankful that you were always so open because not everyone is, but I especially got to see a change in your work. You know, when I first met you, you were still undergrad, but when you got into the master's program that idea of narrative really crystallized and I'd always had that in my work but it brought home the importance to me because you were talking about your program and I was listening very closely at what they were teaching you and it, it was cool so thanks for the free education <laughs> oh you're welcome bro <laughs> and you know th that's the thing about being an artist even being a photographer or whatever you want to call it Everybody's a writer here. Everyone's a visual writer. The only thing we're writing with are visual forms. We write with color. We write with shape, right? Yeah. It's really all about the narrative. How you put it together, hey, that's up to you. If you want to take from Rauschenberg, combine it with um, Matisse, hey, go for it. You know, No one says that's not allowed. Right yeah. now, in, 20, in 21st century, everything's allowed. You want to combine... Um, let's say take someone like Damien Hirsch and combine them with Banksy. That's fine. You know, there's nothing that says that's not allowed. You can do whatever you want. So you're, you're talking about the only thing I would say is just make sure it's aesthetically strong. Yeah. But you're talking about like taking from this, taking from that. Do you think I'm in those terms? You do? I didn't get that last part. Oh, yeah, you lagged there a little bit. I didn't hear you. Um, well, you talk, You were talking about, you know, taking from Rauschenberg, taking from this person, and combining. Do you think of it in those terms? Uh, I think it's another option that you have. Yeah, but do you? you? Know? Because I'm just uh, curious as a, as a spectator of your art. I have before, but not lately. 
Okay. You know, you know um, like I said before, everything comes from within. What I'm trying to do is tap into um, a kind of uh, automatism, you know, like Salvador did, Salvador Dali. Mm-hmm. So you're not trying to say, oh, let me draw a car. What you're trying to do is escape from your hand and let your subconscious draw within something that's within you that you don't really are trying to say. Let that truth come out without it being uh, some kind of pers- purposeful mark making. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the, the best way to put it is for myself, I'm trying to get to the the highest apex of storytelling. And that, that's what I always felt. That's what I was always drawn to. Increasingly, that was what made me pick up paint and really go for it because I thought I, I dig that. Whereas a lot of times I think I saw what you were talking about. People, and it's natural. Things are an influence on you whether you admit it or not you know i i've always it's a pet peeve the self-taught artist you grew up looking at something even if it was a norman rockwell poster in a restaurant we all are exposed to art because art is expression and it's everywhere but i i always like i said i was drawn to that and it's like that's what I would do in my photographs. And it, and I was like, well, you know, I want to do that in paint. So, yeah, man. And it comes out, it shows. Yeah, well, yeah, and likewise, I, um, I, wish, uh, I wish I could see some of your new pieces in person, but um, maybe one of these days. I, I, oh, yeah, in person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I did send you a couple. Yeah, yeah. It's looking cool, man. So, what else, man? What um, is that? How many years has it been since grad school? What, what, what um? Talk about that. Talk about, uh, talking about you mean, well, what we were doing or the philosophy? What are you? Well, you, what would you like to know? Well, you you graduated, yeah. Yeah, 2015. Talk about post-graduation. Um, it's still the same kind of routine. For me, you know, you get up, you do your routine, you hit the canvas. It's really that simple. When I was in class, you set up the canvas, mm-hmm. you just attack it. Like I said before, you know, some people – They'll sketch it. They'll sketch their whole scene and then paint. That's fine for some. I'm more of a Jackson Pollock kind of person. I'm not going to waste that time. I'm going to go into the paint. Whatever comes out, I'll edit it afterward. But I have to get to work. So, you know, I'm already into the four corners. I'm not worried about, hey, am I going to put a bowl of fruit here? Or am I going to put a broomstick here? To me, that's a step that can be eliminated. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that process that I had in school, it's the same in the studio. You know, prime your canvas, stretch it. You're ready to go. Um, there's been a few times where I'll think of an exercise just to do, just to get my – brain going but usually i'll pick up something to apply the paint and that's it doesn't matter what it is you pick up a fork you paint with a fork get a screwdriver you know some paper towels or whatever it is that's it man It, it is really funny hearing you explain all this because i've always known that you were an influence but hearing you narrate it, um, I was watching that whole time. You know, a lot of my questions is, I had to do this, and you 
yeah, sometimes it's like, well, I grabbed this and I did this. And um, that's just, that's hilarious. There's a, a cool video of um, Julian Schnabel. Am I saying that right? Schnabel. <laughs> um, but uh, the interviewer asks him, well, how do you get this effect? And it's a large canvas. And he looks at him very calmly and he says, well, that's easy. And he drags his hand and he walks across the canvas. And I'm like, wow, it really is that easy, you know? But, and, and that urgency, because that's an urgency what you're talking about. I'm, I picked that up or I had that in me already. Um, what, where does that come from for you? You mean the technique or the method? That sense of, like, when you're talking about it, it's like, yeah, I'm the same way. I'm not going to waste time. Like, I have my moments where I really will focus and fine tune. But for the most part, I just want to go. For me, especially over the years, um, having friends pass away, I always think when I come into the studio, I don't know if I'll get to come back. So I'm gonna lay this down and I'm going to, I'm gonna make stuff and and form will come, you know? What What is it like to you? Okay, can you repeat that last part? Oh man. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, like I said, the sense of urgency to just create, to not sketch it out, to not sit there and pause. Where does that come from for you? The best way to explain it is after you do it so long, you don't have to think about it. You just do it. You just start. It's like, you know how some people take a while to get to work? Some artists, they don't need to prep anything. They just work. And so that doesn't start in the beginning. You build up to that kind of methodology. You know, it takes time to – it's like anything else. You put so many hours into it, eventually you just begin. It's really that – you have to put so, many, so much time and so many man hours – to eventually become that, you know. I guess that makes but sense. I, yeah. I think at the at the at the end of the day, though, every pro everybody at the beginning has that in some form or another, you know. Or else, you know, they be going through a very long process, you know, from A to X, you know, but. Why would you have to follow all those steps if you already know part of it is in the process? So unless you begin the process, there is no narrative, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm reflecting a lot here. You know, when I dipped into the paint, it felt like that immediately. But really, I had put my 10,000 hours into photography. I had composition. I had color theory. I had all of those things coming in. So, you know, really painting wise, it, it's weird that that was all there, but I never stopped I, to heavily, heavily think why. But yeah, that's cool. So what's next, Yeah, because if, if you think about it, you know, just it's, probably easier for you from going from one medium just to a different medium. You're just using different materials. Yeah. Right? I mean... Well, there was a reason I, think I was around you. Photographers didn't understand me. And now I understand why. Because I wasn't a photographer. I was good at it. Right. But I was way different than my other photo peers. You know, I... um. I, uh, to me, everything was a tool. A lot of photographers are about like uh, 
their gear and talking about this. And I um, would fall asleep. I learned that stuff and it was just ingrained in me. Kind of how we were talking about, like, you have the tools. Then after a while, you don't have to think about it. Yeah. It, at the point that I was, I didn't have to think about it. You know, that was like, uh, it still is. Because I still use photography to promote myself. Right. What we're doing right now, it's, a, it's part of that medium. And I'm glad I had it in my past. But Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. It's a very multi. It's good to be multifaceted. I was talking about that with the. My last conversation was an artist around here called. Uh, she's, her name is Cindy Shepard. And um, she's a city council person here, and makes really cool, cool art. But she was talking about kind of being, almost ADD about, this project, that project, and um. And so. You know, I said, don't you think that's part of the creative process? We do jump from project to project. I think that's just how most of us think. And I certainly watched you do that a lot. You know, um, I think one of my favorite pieces I have of yours, American Bacon. You remember that one? <laughs> yeah. A, that was a great piece, yeah. It's just a flag. And during that era of your work, you were, uh, and you were getting criticism about it because you were getting, uh, like, uh, I guess stickers. You're just putting them on, and pe people were like, "Why? Are you, that's not painting." And you're like, "Yes, it is." <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I was like, "Yeah, that's my boy." You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. You know why? Because he said so, and that. Uh, that to me like gave me swagger when I went to to make stuff because I'm like I'm like I could do anything I want this is my world <laughs> exactly you're right even more so today in today's time you know yeah <laughs> so you have that freedom man that's the great thing about being an artist you break all the rules all the time you create your own mm -hmm. rules and you can break it someone else's so you're not bound by anything you're not chained to anything whatever you want to express i'll tell you something when i was doing undergrad at u of h one of my professors the chicano sculptor luis Jimenez, who passed away due to the blue uh, demon sculpture that fell on him so right before that happened he goes you know what jesse the artist is an observer. Create whatever you see. It's really that simple. Yeah. You know? And so I always have that in the in the back of my mind. You know, you're not limited by anything. No one can tell you anything. And if they do, fuck them. Simple as that. <laughs> there you go, man. That's a that, that's we should put that on a t-shirt, Jesse. <laughs> I love that. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been during this time, I'm just reflecting, really trying to stay alive too economically. But I think for many creatives, I almost feel like this is going to be a renaissance of art because so many people are sitting there thinking, hey, I could work on that thing I didn't work on because I was working this or that job doing um, something I didn't like, something I didn't love. That to me is what art has always been. You know, I yeah. always had projects. I actually remember the first time I saw paint, I was three. I was going to this little school in Chicago that my mom, I begged my mom to take me to pre-K. And I remember the first time I saw paint, things like that growing up just stuck with me. And they always made me want to make things. And it's about, always about a pursuit of happiness for me. What is it to you? 
Why did you start making things? Why, why do you continue to? Um, well, are we talking about? Well, it's, it's. I don't know if I can probably put it in, just one, a one word answer, but. Well, it's certainly not a one word answer. You know, yeah. I mean, I think. If I was to say why I do it, I feel like I have a responsibility if you have this creative gene. And whether sometimes I'll use it in terms of a kind of art therapy or art healing, not only for myself, but for others. And so I don't know if that's the primary reason, but I definitely get a sensibility of helping my fellow man see things maybe they forgot or maybe they need to see it again. We all need reminders sometimes, you know, and whether you do it through paint or you do it through clay, you do it through metal, you do it through wood, whatever you do it through, I think it's your duty. If, you, if you're a creative person, you know, every like I said before, we're all writers. We're all visual writers. Whether you want to call paintings poems or songs, whatever they are to you, you know, it's up to you to do it in whatever capacity you can complete it in, right? Like, if you're blessed with a certain artistic talent, you wouldn't be doing yourself justice to let that go to waste. You see what I'm saying? So it really doesn't w matter if you're working large scale, miniatures, creating doll houses or whatever it is. You're supposed to be getting that work out into the world. You know, even if you think, well, I'm not selling a lot. Maybe it's for someone else to come in contact with. So it sparks them. It's kind of like a domino effect. You know, and I've had people say, hey, Jesse, how do I throw a show? They'll contact me, email me, hey, where can I set up, you know, or what can I do or what do I have to do to get a grant? You know, I'll give them some free advice. You know, this is what you have to do. You might get rejected once. Hey, you might get rejected three times. You still got to, you know, put those applications in for especially grants for artists because right now there's a lot of them. Well, you know, I'll go back to, um, like I said, I was always picking your brain and always grateful that you would just give the information. That had an effect on me. A lot of what I, I'm not sure how current you are and what I do right now, aside from making art and selling it, I uh, am part of Central Arts. It's a 501c and... Wow. The one of the coolest things we did start it was we started last summer at this new location here in Hearst, Texas, and we have kid camps that were six dollars a kid per day. Yeah. And so, because I was looking at kids camps around here, and I was remembering. I mean, you grew up in Houston too, and um, what part of town were you in? Originally. Yeah. Originally, like I'm as from, uh, yeah, as a, as a kid, I was East End. Yeah. Yeah, well, and you were probably like me. I grew, grew up on the north side. Not much to do. There wasn't a lot of art classes. Um, there was very few. There was one where my mom took me. It was five bucks. And I always remember that, that she was able to take me, and they canceled it. But it made an impression and you're talking about responsibility to me. I guess why what I was getting at, it makes me happy. I want other people to be happy. It doesn't mean they have to be artists, but they should have a little piece of this. They should experience what it's like to make something. If it's not what they go on to do, that's okay. But they should have that joy because it rocks to me 
Yeah. It's, I get up every morning and, you know, you're talking about the ritual. My ritual is no different. I get up, I have other responsibilities, but one, at one point in that day, I will hit the studio and I will make stuff, whether it's drawing, painting, gluing things onto other things. But that, um, and that I think emanates for everybody from childhood. I remember your early work, there was a lot of cartoons in it. And I remember asking you, and you said, you know, when I was little, I was in front of the TV a lot. And, um, but they were happy pieces to you. You know, giant hulks and yeah. uh, characters from the comic strips. And um, yeah, just yeah, really cool. So what, what, um, you know, a lot of what we do. Yeah. You know, it comes from childhood. Totally. Do you ever see, do you know John Alexander's work? It's just sometimes you revisit. Yeah, he's good. He's great. Okay, so, um, do you ever heard him talk? Um, you're, you're lagging a little bit, but I'll just continue here. Hopefully you can hear me. I've seen him with a couple of his YouTubes. Okay. Well, have you ever seen it, him talk where, where his, uh, the, there's a swampiness in his, uh, in his work. You could, you could just yeah. see that everywhere. And that's the region where he grew up, um, you know, east of Houston towards New Orleans. Wow. Just that swampiness. And yeah, that never leaves that leaves us. To me, is growing up in the neighborhoods I grew up in. It was my dad working on cars, junkyards, that texture that I also picked up from you, but it was pleasing to me because that is the landscape of my childhood. That's what my world looked like. And I wasn't sitting there crying, you know, saying, oh, this neighborhood sucks. To me, it was beautiful. Peeling paint, deteriorating buildings. I thought it looked glorious. You know, as I grew up oh, to be older, I was like, man, that neighborhood sucked. But, <laughs> hmm. but the beauty of it never, never left me. Yeah. You can always use it as some kind of resource material. It's still here, you know. It's yeah, still in your work, probably. So, and that and it, and that's weird because it's like it, it's something. I think even if you wanted to shake something like that, it'd be really difficult. It's ingrained in your expression. It's ingrained in your voice, like DNA or something. You know? Yeah, exactly. So, um, as far as Houston, like, what, um, I don't know, how's, how's everybody else doing there? Are you um, in contact with anybody, or? No, I mean, not a, not outside of really the, the art team. Um, and that's what I mean. I think we're getting more and more back to more and more back to normal. Um, but before it was really kind of a you wouldn't see too many cars on the street anymore. Everybody was just really staying at home. Mm -hmm. So little by little, I think we're getting back to normal, as normal as you can get anyway. Yeah, I think it'll be a little while. I think you need to study your social media Jesse yeah for sure and if you need help you know it. if you need help I'm, I'm getting fairly knowledgeable at it I'm, you know I'm doing all right and every day I have new ideas this was an idea you know it's first of all it's documentations of the conversations we would have anyway which increasingly like I start to realize other people find interest in too you know, aside, there's artists, but then the more I work within the community 
and uh, work on projects and murals and um, I'm realizing that there is an interest and it's also a need to shine light on it. You know, I've always thought it was weird that at some point in art history, it became kind of an esoteric thing. You know, like the way our conversation, we believe that art belongs to everybody. Um, but it's not made to feel that way oftentimes, you know? Hmm. And yeah, I can. It's something, it's something that I highly, I would say even kind of rage against. I don't want anybody to feel estranged by creativity. You know, it's like, I always bring up the example. If I ask somebody, um, what's your favorite band? They could say this band. What do you think of this band? They'll say that band sucks. Now, most of the time, those people aren't musicians. But you ask them, who's your favorite artist? What do you think of this art? Oftentimes you'll hear, well, you know, I really don't know much about art. And really all you need to know is that you have an opinion and you could express that opinion. And if you think that that art is no good, that's a valid point of view. Sure. You don't like it. It's not for you. Not your cup of tea. Right. <laughs> but I, I think that's an important message. So I want to yeah, for proliferate sure. it, you know, until we're out of here, which, uh, you know, it's funny, I was thinking about the more I read about marketing and uh, social media, I remember you and I talking about how uh, robots will one day make art. You remember that conversation? A little bit. <laughs> well, I, I, it kind of went, like I said, hey, it's going to happen. And um, I just hope we're dead by then. Because <laughs> <laughs> really, you think about marketing, you know, I was talking about, uh, we were talking about the idea of, we put up our Instagrams, or our social media, and we are, we're trying to make them like neat little galleries, like what we ideally would like people to walk into. But virtual space isn't like that, um, you know, and then starting to think about things like virtual reality. When people, now this is going to get weird, but uh, people putting on contact lenses and all of a sudden you're in the Louvre, right? Mm, right. What does that do to um, people who make things and uh, want to physically sell them to you when they can, they can just uh, virtually have anything. <laughs> Almost virtually have everything except the actual piece. It will, um, it will get <laughs> to where there's no distinction, dude. Like I said, I hope we're dead because, yeah. <laughs> cause I don't know how to deal with that as a human. Robots right. will win. And, uh, <laughs> so there. <laughs> To add That's a, a tough point. To add a, you know, totally optimistic uh, <laughs> point of view to things. But it's something to think about. We're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. We're, uh, I don't know. How do we, how do you sell the robots? Do you even sell the robots? Do they even care? But <laughs> I don't know. Obviously. I like to have a robot president. How's that? Oh, man. <laughs> Well, we, we're <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that. I, um, I I don't really. It's very few times I get political in my artwork. What about you? Hmm. I mean, aside from American say, bacon, I can't think of another one. I wouldn't say not that kind of politics. I'll probably create more of a 
sociopolitic message than government politics. You know, uh, I leave that to the experts. You know, some people say politics can coexist with art. It's, it's tough. It really depends on the kind of message. Um, if you're thinking about something like Jasper Johns and how he did the flag, I can appreciate that. Um, there's some other artists who are political. Let's take Bank uh, Banksy for exa example. There's, there's He's very political. Right? Yeah, there's definitely right? um, successful political art. Yeah, exactly. It really depends how you do it. So, I mean, you know, it's like anything else, you know, how you present the narrative, it can be a classic piece. It was, I mean, we are in strange times, we can agree. Um, and it was weird because I, I, I didn't view it as a political thing, but um, what we were talking about with George Floyd and all of all related things is a human rights thing. And I found myself, I made about four pieces about that, which was. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, and it was one of those things where I couldn't help it. I just, the first one was my version of George Floyd. It was very, I don't know if you remember my Mayan work. Yeah. But I made it in that style. And then I made um, the three more, and they were about my friends around here that I think about. And I think about when I see things like that happen and I worry about. And that was portraits of, of these fellas. And you know, it just had their names, like uh, Teal Sun's Life Matters, Austin Wayfield Life, His Life Matters, and and then uh, Muhammad Sali was the third one. And it was just their portrait, and it was, it was weird because it, it you know, they, those are heavier statements. And the way people seem to be heated about even a trip to Costco at the moment, I almost felt, well, I felt vulnerable putting that out there. And um, that um, that's when art can get scary, I think. That is the hardest thing about art. When people ask me, it's the vulnerability you put yourself at. Because even whatever you make, however trivial it may seem is an extension of you. And, uh, have you felt that way a lot? Because I, I know that your stuff is really, you're digging deep a lot of the time. Well, I mean, you definitely try not to, uh, you don't take it personally, you know. Um, it can be tough sometimes because anytime you make a piece, you open yourself to criticism, you know, and vulnerability is, it can, it can really, if you're not careful, can set you in a different kind of state. Um, that's why I really don't leave a, I don't show a piece, I try not to, or let it go out into the world, unless I know it can stand on its own. Because at the end of the day, someone's going to question you on it. And if you can't defend it, then you really failed in a way. You know what I'm saying? I think that's a mindset, though. I'm thinking increasingly about – I'm going to keep bringing him up because I'm just watching. And honestly, he's inspiring me to – that Gary Vee thing is the reason I'm doing this podcast. But that whole idea of content, because he's – He's talking a lot of times to musicians. He's like, how many songs do you have? It's like 10. How many have you put out? It's like one. Why? Because the, the others aren't good. He's like, put those out and then be done with them and keep moving, keep moving. Yeah. And um, now every time I create 
piece, I'm good with it. You know, is it as successful as this piece? Maybe not. If people want to question it, they can. But my attitude increasingly is like, well, you know, that's what I had in me at that moment. And truthfully, it has an audience. Somebody still buys that piece. And right. I feel like I have to defend anything. I, mm. I made that. It's part of my history. Yeah. And if it connected with you, good. You know, this piece may be a lot better, but I love them all the same. So I think- Yeah, as long as, you, as long as you think they're justified, that's really all that matters. Yeah. yeah, that's, well, and that's, I think, different than, I don't know. I don't think you have to defend anything, Jesse. <laughs> the especially you know you and i are we can call ourselves seasoned at this point you know world take yeah. whatever we make <laughs> oh yeah for sure oh but yeah my, my favorite was a photographer i heard talk years ago chuck o'rear and uh it was a video and just got this really gruff voice and he says um you know somebody could tell me that my work is uh shit like i don't give a fuck <laughs> it's funny because i don't know how old he was at the point i i don't know if he's still around to be honest but you know he was older it was funny to hear that voice say those words but as i grow older as i get more seasoned as i think about that idea of vulnerability, I feel the same way. To each his own, right? Yeah. Yeah. But do you, I mean, do you feel that same way? Um, I think you were overthinking it more when you were younger? Hmm. No, I, I never really had a uh, an issue with it uh, being questioned. It, it, if that's what we're talking about. Um, I think as long as that's satisfied what I'm trying to express, eh, that's the only thing that matters at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, because so. really in the larger scope of it, um, it almost doesn't matter in that sense. What matters is that you did what you wanted and what makes you happy oh yeah for sure happiest um but i think sometimes you do want the respect of your peers and so you know if they're going to question you you might take a second glance of what you're doing but everybody wants respect in the game yeah. you know i mean if you want to throw mustard on a canvas and say it's freaking high art i mean that's going to be tough to pull off. Yeah. One, it's already been done. So, well, this is one of the, this is how you came up in my sister's conversation. She reminded me of a story. Um, I don't know if you remember this. This was a, I only heard this story secondhand, but Gallery 19. Remember in the Heights, Houston? Yeah, Max, right? Max? So you walk in there. And um, it's this guy putting up his pieces. And uh, you say to him, hey, man, I like your Rothko's. And apparently, dude, <laughs> blew up. And, <laughs> and uh, I, loved, I loved hearing the story because they were complaining about you to me. I'm like, what do you want me to do? He was saying what he thought. That's what Jesse does. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. you know what? He's not wrong, you know? <laughs> could, he been, could he have been kinder to the guy? I remember that guy. <laughs> like, could he have been kinder to the guy? Maybe, but I mean, hey. <laughs> 
Hey, I told the truth, you know. He couldn't handle it. Right. <laughs> well, well, you're talking about, I think, I always do listen. And if there's a, a piece that I can take and make what I'm doing stronger, of course. Um, but what I've found over the years is I generally don't care. I'm going to do my things. That's why I got in. That's why I became an artist. Yeah. Do my thing. And if I don't do my thing, if I'm worried that this person might not like it or that person might not like it, then I'm not being oh, honest right. with myself or my art. And that's, yeah, that's true. Cause really, oh, for sure. yeah. What people need is an original voice and we are all original. We all have. Yeah. And that's why you were picking on the Rothko guy because like, Hey man, you, uh, I think he was just sensitive. That's all. <laughs> Probably. All right, Mano. I'm going to bring you back on here for sure. Um, tell, tell us, you know, how to get in contact with you. How do we, how do we find Jesse? Um, yeah. I mean, if you want to go to the Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, page, uh, Jesse Alexander Cantu, that's on there. You can reach me at, Jesse Cantu at hotmail.com. Okay. Um, you want to go to the old uh, Pyramid Art Services blogspot.com site. That's still up. And it'll also take you to the new one. And so, you know, you can just type in in Google Jesse Cantu and everything will pop up. All right. Well, that's a wrap, sir. It's been I appreciate it. great connecting with you. Again, man, thank you for all of the inspiration you've generously given to me over the years it has affected other people so you know you're welcome bro anytime we will, we will uh we'll keep that going you know uh there's a lot all of right artists. i appreciate it cuz yeah man thank you very much sergio all right sir we're out have a good one i Number one podcast for artists, expression.